France, they'd get some disaffected old former Napoleonic officer, ply him with wine, and then start saying, God, you remember the good old days, wasn't the emperor marvellous, and the king's fat and ugly, isn't he? And the guy would say yes, and of course three other guys would turn up and say, aha, there you are, you see, he's a dangerous revolutionary. That was Adam Zamoyski talking about the climate of suspicion in Europe after the French Revolution. The maggots that were involved in the Buck Ruxton case persist to this day, they've been preserved and you can see the very maggots that fed on, on Mrs. Ruxton's flesh. And that was Val McDermott on Forensic Science Through History. You're listening to the History Extra podcast from BBC History magazine. We're the UK's best-selling history magazine, available from all good news agents or via subscription. Check out our latest subscription deals at historyextra.com forward slash subscribe. The magazine is also now available on many digital devices, including the iPad, iPhone, Kindle, Kindle Fire, Google Play, Kobo and Zinio. Look out for us in your app store or newsstand, or find out more at historyextra.com forward slash digital. Hello and welcome to our final podcast of November 2014. I'm Rob Attar, the editor of BBC History magazine. Our first interview this week is with Adam Zamoyski, a best-selling British historian whose books range widely over European history. His latest book is Phantom Terror, which focuses on the period between the 1789 French Revolution and the Europe-wide revolts of 1848. The book shows how the ruling classes believed they were about to fall victim to a terrifying conspiracy, and how, in response, they unleashed waves of repression across the continent. I visited Adam in London recently to find out more about this fascinating moment in Europe's history. Why do you think the French Revolution was such an important moment in this story that you're telling in your book? The French Revolution was obviously an extraordinarily important event in itself, and... Um, for a number of reasons I don't probably have to go into, but it was also extraordinarily important in how it was received, and particularly outside France. It's um, absolutely extraordinary the extent to which the first news of the fall of the Bastille elicited an immediate response, you know, whether it was in, in London, in St. Petersburg, in uh, New York, in South America even, places like Lima and Caracas, you know. It was as though people had been waiting for a signal and it immediately polarised people. And those who thought that finally there was going to be a great change in the way the world was organised welcomed it and thought it was marvellous. And all those who had been fearing that the old system was under threat immediately saw in it, in this news, uh, the confirmation of their worst fears, that all those reds under the bed, so to speak, had really been there all along, and they were out um, in the open. And nobody really stopped to, to think, hang about, you know, OK, a mob got out of control, they stormed a, a redundant fortress, which held seven old loonies who had forgotten while they'd been put there. It was in itself a fact of no interest to anybody and no consequence. And yet, because of the way people interpreted it, it assumed huge importance. And uh, what interested me was the way in which uh, the, let's say, the conservatives, those who believed in the old order and feared chain, interpreted this um, outbreak as confirmation of the existence of a great conspiracy of, you know, Freemasons, you know, some traced it right back to the Reformation or even Wycliffe and the Lollards, and um, the idea that there had always been these evil people plotting um, to uh, undermine the two pillars of, of the established order, the church and the throne. The extent to which these people took this as absolutely... Yes, that's it, that proves it all. And how they reacted and how 
politicians and societies throughout Europe reacted is very, very interesting because uh, for obviously the property classes and those who believed in the status quo, uh, they felt under threat and they felt immense fear, quite understandably. But quite soon, that fear began to turn into something else, particularly where the politicians were concerned, where they suddenly, whether consciously or not, began to see the uses of this fear. And we see this again and again in politics, this uneasy line between governments rarely being afraid of a threat and at the same time cynically manipulating that fear to control society, to extend police power, to split the opposition, uh, make any politician who says, hang about, um, shouldn't we take another look, uh, make him look treacherous and evil. The first example of this was, was Pitt's government, which, you know, Pitt the Younger was a reformer in the 1780s. He wanted to reform Parliament. He wanted to get rid of the rotten boroughs. He wanted to do all sorts of marvellous things. He was a, a man of progress. And at first, he had no problem with the French Revolution. By 1793-4, he was exploiting the French Revolution and its fears. He was making hay out of the whole thing, to suspend habeas corpus, throw people in jail without trial, concoct absolutely ludicrous uh, reports on how this country was um, threatened with revolution. Mm. And to perjure himself in the most frightful ways, um, and indeed to make war on France unnecessarily, in some cases, to do something which people didn't do, which was to ferment and, and finance plots to assassinate the head of state of, of an okay, an enemy state. But even in, you know, they didn't do that with Louis the Sixteenth when they were at war, or Louis the Fourteenth. You know, that wasn't done. It was extraordinary how this great upheaval of the French Revolution suddenly seemed to bring in a new kind of politics. And it then rather took over governments and politicians and led them into sort of scaring themselves. And, you know, it's like telling ghost stories late at night. There's always a sort of fine line between you trying to scare others and actually getting quite frightened yourself. And this produced, particularly after 1815, when, when suddenly they got rid of Napoleon and theoretically the threat of the French Revolution, and suddenly people like Liverpool and Metternich and Tsar Alexander and Louis XVIII and his ministers all felt they had to police Europe. And they worked themselves up into a frightful stew, and they imagined revolutionary activity everywhere. Um, for instance, in this country, you know, every Luddite who was just breaking machinery in the Midlands simply because he was starving was immediately branded as a revolutionary who wanted to decapitate the king. And by inventing this bogey, they so sort of created a bogey which they began to fear and it, you know, it became a, a self-fulfilling prophecy, which grew to enormous proportions, except then when it did come to fulfill itself in 1848, um, it turned out to be a complete damn squib. Um, and indeed, the only throne that fell was the most liberal throne, <laughs> that of Louis-Philippe. So it's, it's a sort of extraordinary side effect of the French Revolution that this book is about, but one which is still with us and which is to a very significant extent distorted uh, everybody's view of politics ever since. If you read the papers, or particularly if you read political discourse, particularly on the left, there's still this obsession with the idea that, there, that there's one group, the haves, who are entrenched, the toffs, the people who, who own it all. And the outside, beyond the walls, there's a sort of screaming multitude of had nots who want to destroy everything. Whereas, in fact, if you stop to think and look at what's going on around you, then very few people want to bring down the system. Most people just want a rather larger slice of the cake for themselves. So that's one aspect of it uh, which I find fascinating and which um, I found as I was writing this book, it didn't at first occur to me, but it did the more and more I researched it.
which is that it is extremely relevant to today, I suppose to any epoch, but certainly to the first decade of, of this century. The other absolutely fascinating aspect of this period and this subject, uh, which emerged as I was researching it, was the way in which fear affects societies and indeed governments. And in the first place, the way in which it, it generates a, a, a terrible need for intelligence to know what's going on. And the less that appears to be going on, the more people think must be going on. And the idea that since it's difficult to get any real information, it must mean that the opposition is really well organized. The other th is the way it also breeds this um, sense of paranoia and a propensity uh, towards conspiracy theory, um, uh, which develops a life of its own. And of course, what governments um, and politicians um, and rulers uh, felt they had to do was to um, create networks of intelligence gathering so as to know what was going on. And so they recruited endless people who um, were mostly completely amateurish, uh, but above all, who had nothing to do because there was in most cases absolutely nothing to report. And as these people were in most cases paid by bulk, or at least because they were, or if they were, say, if they were actually employed on a regular basis, um, their employment was, you know, dependent on actually coming up with something. They couldn't repeat the report at the end of the week that, as far as they knew, um, you know, Paris was completely calm and nothing was going on. Uh, they'd have been sacked and somebody would have found a better one. So um, they all invented and they all... I mean, we have endless admissions from um, people who worked in the police of the various countries that this was going on. And they did, they did two things. Either they just, just invented anything that came to mind, or else they set people up. And so they'd get some, in France, they'd get some disaffected old former Napoleonic officer who was living in retirement on a pittance. Um, corner him in a cafe or in a white shop and ply him with wine and then start saying, God, do you remember the good old days? Wasn't the emperor marvellous? And the king's fat and ugly, isn't he? And the guy would say yes. And of course, three other guys would turn around and say, aha, there you are. You see, he's a dangerous revolutionary. The poor guy would be flung in jail and a, a plot would have been discovered. Um, and it is absolutely fascinating reading the reports of the French police where they say that the house of such and such a lady is thought to be on very good grounds a meeting place of plotters. People have been seen to come and go. One man who was seen to come and visit her several times has recently arrived from Bordeaux. He was dressed like this and this and this and acted in a suspicious manner. When followed, he uh, climbed into a fiac and uh, managed to lose our agent. This is extremely suspicious, the fact that it was raining and the guy actually got tired of walking. Is neither here nor there. And these, these reports just go on and on. Um, and there's absolutely nothing in them at all. And actually, I mean, uh, I had so much fun um, looking at these reports and the stories and how they were embroidered as they went up every degree. And in some cases, uh, overzealous governors or generals uh, seeking promotion actually concocted full-scale minor rebellions, in various cases in France, in order then to be able to quash them and claim a victory and then be promoted and get a barony or become, get some honour. And the odd thing is that most of the people in power, most of the sensible people in power, if you read their reports and their letters and their diaries, were actually aware that most of this information was actually a load of rubbish. And yet this whole system functioned. And apart from anything else, it was socially very destructive because people were aware that everywhere there were these they're known is in, in France, they're known as mouche or mouchard. In um, Austria, they were known as blue bottles. There were these agents everywhere, and 
Uh, so people didn't talk to each other. People were afraid of, of, of each other. Um, people mistrusted each other. And, you know, it really... And it, and it also contributed to a sense of instability in the end, which actually rendered disservice to the government, because people thought, well, you know, if they're that worried, perhaps they're on to something. And uh, the, the whole period was very much prone to a kind of febrile receptiveness, particularly the sort of 1815 to sort of 1830 period. Every so often there'd be a rumour in France that Napoleon had landed with a great new army, you know, and sometimes it was an army of Americans, sometimes it was an army of Poles, sometimes there were Indians, you know, sometimes there were Mongols. It didn't matter, and suddenly the whole of France would fly into a panic, the gendarmerie would be called out, um, sometimes martial law was proclaimed in, in various provinces, even after Napoleon had died, because, uh, you know, paranoia generates fantasy, and uh, it is a period of extraordinary fantasy. Even though we're talking about a period of well, late Georgian, early Victorian stability, the Industrial Revolution, a period of supposedly um, scientific progress and material um, pragmatism and, and, and empiricism and so on. And yet there's this lunacy going on um, at the very highest level. And it, it sort of shows that you can never really be too sure, you know, how grown up we've become. You know, when nowadays people sometimes say, oh, this couldn't happen in the 21st century. Well, you know, if it could happen then, in, in really quite sophisticated circles, you sort of do wonder slightly. I guess it goes without saying that these conspiracy theories, they were groundless. I mean, were there, were there any people conspiring? Were there revolutionaries in Europe conspiring to bring down these regimes, or was it just total fiction? There were tiny numbers in uh, various countries um, who were undoubtedly plotting. Exactly what they were plotting remains really quite difficult. There's only a very few cases where we know that, that there was some kind of an idea or a plan. You know, in France, there were disgruntled Napoleonic soldiers who sort of thought well, if we call out a regiment at La Rochelle, and they thought that another regiment in Marseille, where there were another couple of officers they'd spoken to, or a couple of sergeants, were nostalgic for the days and periods, that they might come out, and so on. And in the event when they did rise, they never managed, they never succeeded in calling out a single platoon, let alone a regiment. Uh, so... The, the plots were very little more than just a dissatisfaction in that case. In places such as southern Italy, where there were oppressive regimes in, in force, there were plots to, to overthrow the regime, which in fact happened in 1820, um, but it was in order to install a constitutional monarchy, and the same monarchy, but simply to oblige them to sign a constitution and get rid of some of the most corrupt members of the government. Uh, and, in fact, most of the diplomats in Naples said, look, actually, the new government's much better than the old one, and, you know, this is fine. Uh, and, and they've said, you know, if, if anybody objects to any aspect to our constitution, we'll have, gladly change it. In Russia, where, where there was a sort of plot, the Decemberist plot, to, again, to supposedly get the Tsar to implement a constitution, although they didn't really have a blueprint. Um, all they did was uh, what they did in Spain continuously, which is stage what was known as the pronunciamiento, where troops would come out and stand in the square and say, look, we think this should happen, which was little more than, a, than your average demonstration in London. Uh, and, indeed, it was dispersed with a bit of cannon shot. Uh, there was no attempt to fight anybody. There were some assassination attempts, but no more frequent than there had been under Napoleon or under the kings before the revolution or, or than there always were. Uh, in this country, the various working class movements were all just for, um, in favour of parliamentary reform. The Cato Street conspiracy, which was pretty much the only one that, that supposedly wanted he wanted to, to murder the cabinet and proclaim a republic, uh, was, it's almost certain, now it's been established, um, a, a provocation by um, agents of the Home Office. And, you know, so, I mean, the threat was absolutely 
well, it just wasn't there. It was so infinitesimal, it was not there. But it was fed, and certainly after 1830, uh, it did become a real threat, mainly because of the repressions, when every single more or less legitimate attempt to persuade or force governments to bring in constitutions or some kind of reform were repressed with violence and with troops, you know, after things like the Peace Lua Massacre and so on. After all the, the peaceful attempts had, had failed, in between 1830 and 1832 in this country, there was, for the first time, there was a, a real possibility of a French-style revolution, but a sort of middle-class revolution, um, which was entirely the work of Wellington's intransigence. The same was true of, of France, where the 1830 revolution was entirely provoked by Charles X, uh, who threw out a challenge. He kicked the chambers, such as they were, in the teeth, literally, with his ordinances. In 1830, in, in, in Poland, the Tsar again said, I'm not going to negotiate with anybody until everybody's crushed. And the ruthless putting down of the Neapolitan and other Italian insurrections in 1820 and the Spanish one did force people into extremism. So by the mid-30s, this policy had actually created a rootless body of a sort of international of plotters, but they were so unbelievably incompetent and, um, and few and far between that they represented absolutely no, no threat, even when they got together. And indeed, in 1848, when, when they had ideal conditions, because the famines everywhere had produced such discontent that there were popular risings all over Europe, and they sprang into action thinking, oh, jolly good, we've got our revolution. And it turned out that, you know, within a year the whole thing had been had burnt itself out and nobody was interested in them at all. And people like Karl Marx, hysterical, he just, he, he chased around Europe trying to catch a revolution to sort of, as it were, to climb onto its back and, and couldn't make it. So the, the idea that there was this great, you know, the other obsession of people like Metternich, which was then swallowed hook, line and sinker by um, both the Tsars of Russia, by the Emperor of Austria and the King of Prussia and most rulers, even in the end Wellington, that there was a worldwide conspiracy, that there was this directing body sitting in Paris, which was like a sort of spider in the middle of the web, directing and tweaking things so that when one revolution broke up somewhere, just as the troops were off to march to quell that, another revolution would break out and so on. And they, um, they got so obsessed with this idea of this comité directeur, as they called it, that um, they even thought that when President Monroe recognized the South American republics and um, announced the Monroe Doctrine, they said, ah, he was directed from Paris. <laughs> You know, I come back to this extraordinary aspect of the thing that these people created a fantasy semi-conscious of the fact that it was fantasy and then swallowed it. And it's, a, it's a, an extraordinary exercise in self-delusion, which is just fascinating almost um, from the point of view of human psychology, let alone history. There's another respect in which this obsession with um, revolution had far-reaching and extremely damaging consequences uh, for certainly for Europe and possibly the world, was the way in which the idea that since there was a conspiracy going on somewhere in Europe's underbelly, absolutely any kind of innovation or any manifestation of, of anything new or reform of any kind was necessarily dangerous. Thus, Metternich, when he heard of the plan to found um, a secular university in London, immediately warned the King of England that if this came to pass, he would lose his throne and the monarchy would be abolished within years. Well, you know, University College London was established a year later and we still got a monarchy. Um, and but this went far, far deeper, and it meant that, for instance, in Austria, the authorities discouraged, uh, from the 1790s onwards, they discouraged 
uh, the establishment of factories, because factories created a proletariat, which was ruthless and could be used for revolutions. And they discouraged trade, because, of course, people who traveled were suspect, because they could spread information, pass on messages. So there were great restrictions placed on movement of people. And, of course, they censored literature and, to such an extent, and indeed publication and bookshops. Um, the, the list of works published on the index in Austria in the sort of 1830s is just in the 1840s is, is hysterical. And of course it turned Austria into what people used to call the China of Europe. It became a dead society where people were afraid to talk, people were afraid to write anything in letters because all ret letters were intercepted. People couldn't read the latest literature. Indeed they couldn't read the latest scientific literature because that was subversive. So, no doubt, very great Austrian minds didn't contribute, weren't allowed to contribute to um, the development of, of thought, and so on and so forth. And, of course, it became industrially a very backward place and so on. Uh, in Russia, well, one hardly needs to, to, to point to um, what the consequences are. A, a, a world shut off, a society that was arrested in its development, which was the Russians were not allowed to to travel to Paris because they might get um, infected by revolutionary ideas. And all over Europe, uh, people were, literature was stymied, ideas were rendered dangerous. Uh, and in this country, we were pretty fortunate in that, in that there was minimal uh, censorship and minimal restrictions. In most other countries, uh, they they had a huge impact. But even in this country, it's been argued that the repressions of the 1790s and the early 1800s actually uh, wiped out a whole generation of potentially important literary figures who were just so depressed by being thrown into jail every five minutes, having their papers searched and, and burnt and confiscated, that they gave up writing. So the consequences of this strange phenomenon that I write about were immense and far-reaching. And so by the time we get to 1848, how much more oppressive were these kind of European regimes than they had been before 1789? Had, had a real sea change taken place or had they already been quite repressive? In 1789, uh, the whole of Europe was modelled on a the system of... of really arbitrary, top-down top government. It, it varied from country to country, and in some cases arbitrary power was in the hands of a monarch, sometimes in the hands of a camarilla of ministers around the monarch, because uh, the modern monarch in, in said case was too idle to do anything except go hunting and play with his mistresses and would hand over to a minister or a couple. Or, as in England, uh, much more in the hands of a whole landed class, which um, not only through Parliament, but also through local justices, uh, effectively uh, ruled the whole country, uh, much as it uh, wished. That had changed in most countries uh, by the 1840s. Um, certain constitutional ideas, um, certain principles of the rule of law had gained ground. It was very uneven. For instance, in Russia, nothing much had changed. I could argue it had actually gone backwards. In Austria, it had, um, it had eased a bit um, in certain ways. In, in various German states, the picture was a little bit different. In France, it was much more progressive by then as it was in England. The revolutions of 1848 uh, were I interesting because, I mean, uh, all revolutions, of course, have many causes, but um, the uh, revolution of 1789 was a mixture of, of um, as usually happens, of great poverty and hardship amongst the lowest um, and the poorest classes. And that was the same in the case um, in 1848. However, what turns bread riots into a revolution is something else. And it, uh, every revolution requires a leadership uh, to suddenly take control of the masses and to then actually walk over their backs and take power. 
And in the case of 1789, it was the nobility and the aspiring, those who aspired to noble status or to at least to, to, to the, the status enjoyed by nobles, who did that. In 1848, what's very interesting is that there was a general feeling of anger which was amongst the middle and classes and even in, in many cases amongst the, the nobility in Europe, a general anger against against modern forms of government. Government had become fantastically regulatory. Again, these wretched police forces, these passports, every, everything was being um, invigilated, everything was being regulated. And for the middle classes, there was prosperity, but there wasn't much promise. And so students, young people, young professionals felt stymied, felt bored, felt that, that there was no future for them. Very similar situation to 1789 in, in many ways. And they jumped into the saddle when the bread riots and the trouble started in 1848. And this is particularly true of uh, most of Central Europe and Germany. Uh, but having achieved their particular demands, you know, lawyers being allowed to practice in certain ways, publishers being able to publish more freely and so on and so forth, journalists being able to write what they wanted, having achieved various rights like this, they then entirely lost interest in the revolution and pulled the ladder up behind them. Uh, which is why those, the 1848 revolution uh, petered out so quickly. What's more, they very quickly began to defend their newly found uh, privileges. Uh, and of course, the, 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 the wonderful irony of the whole episode is that, whereas in 1815, the victorious allies all vowed that they saw Napoleon and the, the Bonaparte family and the whole Napoleonic idea as the incarnation of revolution and the thing that needed to be stamped out above all. Um, it was, in fact, another Napoleon who restored order in, in France in um, 1849 and 50 and 51, um, and who um, reinstated the Pope in Rome and um, brought back um, the kind of order they all loved. So it's a subject that's full of the most wonderful ironies. It's, it, it's actually terribly funny. I mean, you, you, you stand back and you, you wonder how, how blind people could be and how um, also shameless they could be. Um, but then I suppose if we look at our own epoch, much the same rings true. What do you see as the, the consequences of, of the, this behaviour by the regimes of Europe for the period after 1848? And did that impact on some of things that happened in the latter part of the 19th century? The interesting thing is that 1848 is a kind of caesura. Um, the date's always difficult, and, and um, it's a convenient one. And in a sense, you could say that possibly 1870 would be a better date. But certainly the period after 1848 shows a marked change in in the whole makeup of of the european political struggle in that before 1848 most of those engaged in some kind of subversion be they italian german or polish nationalists be they bonapartist former officers in france be they reformers radical reforms in england chartists and so on and be they um, liberal intellectuals in russia what they all aspire to is, in one way or another, a more enlightened, a more rational, a more generous, a more liberal setup. Few of them are categorical that there should be a republic. Most of them are perfectly happy with the monarchy. Most of them are perfectly happy with private property, the rule of law, and you know, all the rest of it. There's really, there are very, very few um, radicals like Proudhon, you know, demanding, you know, nationalisation or you know the abolition of private property. There are a handful of, of marginals whom nobody takes seriously. And and this is the important thing is that while they are prepared to take up arms, uh, they're not very bloodthirsty. And one of the extraordinary aspects of the three glorious days of July 1830 in Paris, as they were called, was the 
absence of of any kind of um, score settling. There was very little looting. There was very little bloodshed. Once the the regime had fallen, everybody took to celebrating, and there was a great sense of fraternity between and aristos and street urchins, and um, you know everybody notes this. And the same is very largely true of most of the the upheavals between 1815 and 1848, and indeed of many of those of 1848 itself. But then the mood of the subversive changes, and increasingly you get these conspirators and, and revolutionaries uh, throughout Europe, but you know, particularly in Russia and Germany, who are really vowed to destruction and mayhem, um, people who really believe in assassination, in murder, in bring, really do believe in bringing the whole system crashing down. In fact, the, the, the forebears of the Bolsheviks, who go back not to their pedigree isn't of a nice liberal 18th century idea of constitutional government. Their pedigree goes, um, reaches back to Robespierre and blood and terror in order to bring about social justice. And their ideas of social, social justice uh, became quite extreme. And so in a sense you could say that uh, all this demonizing of conspiracy and of any kind of uh, liberal leanings only uh, created a worse monster. I know it's a bit earlier on the book you made the point that you don't want to just draw explicit comparisons between then and now, but do you think there are any lessons that policymakers of today could take from this period when it comes to dealing with an apparent threat or a, a, a believed threat? I find it difficult at times to resist uh, drawing parallels between what I was writing about and some of the events that have taken place in our own country in the last 15 years. And indeed, the, the word dodgy dossier sprang to mind several times and as um, I was reading through the reports of the parliamentary committees of secrecy of the 1790s and the you know, 1817 and 1819. And there certainly are tremendous parallels there. In terms of what lessons one should draw from this, um, I think, you know, the, the fundamental lesson of actually all of history, is not to get carried away and not, not to get stampeded into taking up positions before having really worked out what on earth is going on. And secondly, and possibly the most important, is that unless you can really crush something effectively and completely, which is in most cases very, very difficult to do, unless you can take it literally by the head and the neck, then it's very, very dangerous to start levelling big guns at it uh, because it almost invariably nourishes the, whatever opposition, conspiracy, resistance there is. It notably creates um, martyrs and, and which help the cause because the scattergun approach inevitably hurts innocent people and brings in people who would otherwise never support such a cause. And that is why very often um, terrorist groups exploit this by, by planting themselves and their positions amongst innocent civilians who don't necessarily support them because when the ruling power then bombs that and kills a whole lot of civilians, their families then join the cause. Um, and that's a, an old, well-tried tactic. But above all, I think that the, the greatest lesson that comes out of this is that, you know, what is extraordinary about this whole period is that we're dealing with extremely intelligent people. Prince Metternich was a very, very intelligent, well-read man who had seen war and peace. He had met some of the most extraordinary people of his time. He'd met and negotiated with Napoleon. He'd been through some extraordinary events. He'd run a very complicated monarchy, he'd saved it, he'd been an extraordinary diplomat, he'd been a very, very good administrator in many ways, and yet his real problem was he lacked imagination, and he lacked the ability to sit down and say, well, okay, Clement, now let's just go back right to the beginning and think again. Who are these German students who we've been chucking into jail? 
and these Italian carbonari who we've been sending down for 15 years, hard labor. What do they actually want? You know, are they that really that different from me? Are they really mad dogs who can't be cured? I mean, and in so many cases, had he been able to do that, he would have realized that most of these people were completely harmless if left alone. And particularly in the case of, of the Italian nationalists of this period, if they'd been allowed to go to the opera and then come out and sing patriotic songs in the square afterwards and then go and sit in the cafes making patriotic speeches and then go home to bed, there'd have been no problem. But the minute they started being arrested and subjected to most ghastly tortures and, and um, jail sentences, uh, they became martyrs and they had to get serious. And that's true of... of um, most of the German students actually were, there was a simple fact that there were too many universities in Germany churning out too many ambitious young people who couldn't find jobs because there wasn't a German state. And so there wasn't the forum on which they could shine and there weren't jobs for them. And so they became revolutionaries, or at least discontented people, eager for change. And I think that very possibly now, every time when some kind of new terrorist movement appears on the scene, possibly, I don't know, but very possibly, uh, authorities immediately jump to conclusions which may not be uh, entirely correct and possibly a closer look at what's going on and certainly in the early stages would certainly indicate a, a more sensible response. Obviously, it at the moment, we're dealing with, with something which is very different because it's, uh, in large measure, a religiously inspired set of uh, movements. And, and, and they've developed a life of their own, which, of course, had people that taken notice earlier, um, might not have happened. But still, I think the, there seems to be an enormous amount of overreaction by everybody concerned, uh, which doesn't seem to be yielding the right fruit. And, and I think that that is certainly the, the lesson to be drawn from this book. And I think a bit of reflection and certainly a bit of imagination is always a good thing in politicians. That was Adam Zamoyski. Phantom Terror, The Threat of Revolution and the Repression of Liberty, 1789 to 1848, is out now in the UK, published by William Collins. In the US, it is due to be published next February by Basic Books. Now it's time for the latest history news with our website editor, Emma McFarlane. The Sainsbury's Christmas advert, which depicts the 1914 Christmas truce, quote, confuses people about why the war carried on and perpetuates myths about the conflict, First World War expert Mark Connolly has said. In an interview with History Extra, Professor Connolly said the television advert, which has been viewed more than 12 million times on YouTube and has fiercely divided public opinion, quote, does not help people to understand what really happened. It confuses people about why the war carried on. Too much emphasis has been placed on the Christmas truce. If there was so much love in 1914, then why did the war drag on for four more years? We have overladen the truce with sentimentality, but in reality it was just a day off for troops. He continued, The advert is accurate, but for very few soldiers. It is a snapshot presented as a panorama. In reality, the truce can be localised to just one or two battalions. The advert also perpetuates the idea that young men were forced to fight. That is too simplistic. On its website, Sainsbury's says, quote, While our ad is a fictionalised version of the events that took place, we've made every effort to ensure that the details are as authentic as possible. Every aspect of the production, everything from the depth of the trenches to the insignia on the uniforms, is historically accurate. You can read this story in full and share your views by visiting historyextra.com. In other news, Napoleon's hair is to be put into limited edition watches. According to the Telegraph, half-millimetre slices of the Emperor's locks will be placed inside a series of 500 watches. The hair was part of a 1,000-piece trove of Napoleon memorabilia belonging to Monaco's royal family, auctioned off earlier this month near Paris. The watches will sell for around €8,000, which is the equivalent of about £6,350, says DeWitt watchmakers.
Meanwhile, an American historian has claimed that the first Thanksgiving dinner took place half a century earlier than was previously thought. While tradition holds that the first Thanksgiving was celebrated in 1621, when English pilgrims at Plymouth Plantation in Massachusetts shared a harvest with their Native American neighbors, Michael Gannon told Florida Today that the first such meal was actually eaten in 1565. On the 8th of September that year, following a religious service, Spaniards shared a communal meal with the local native tribe, says Gannon. You can read other surprising Thanksgiving facts at historyextra.com. Thanks, Emma. And now we have a short advertisement break. This winter, don't miss the blockbuster exhibition Conflict Time Photography at Tate Modern. From seconds after a bomb is detonated to a former scene of battle, years after a war has ended, this innovative and moving exhibition focuses on the passing of time, tracing diverse and poignant journeys through over 150 years of conflict around the world, seen through the camera lens. Conflict Time Photography is open now. Book your tickets today at tate.org.uk. Before our next interview, I'd like to quickly mention our next reader events, which are taking place in March next year. On the 21st and 22nd of that month, we're holding two day events themed around Magna Carta and Waterloo. At each event, you'll get the chance to hear from a selection of expert speakers and enjoy a buffet lunch. For more details and tickets, please visit historyextra.com forward slash events. And as always, BBC History magazine subscribers will get discounted entry. Scottish crime writer Val McDermott has been solving fictional crimes for many years, but her most recent book, Forensics: The Anatomy of Crime, looks at the people who do it for real, examining the history of forensic science from its early beginnings to today's groundbreaking procedures. Our featured editor Charlotte Hodgman caught up with Val to find out more. So Val, what is it about forensics that that holds such fascination for you? Well, I've always been a, a lover of crime fiction. I suppose from the earliest days of reading people like Conan Doyle, I was aware of the importance of of science in the process of investigation. So when I started thinking about writing crime fiction myself,、uh, I had to, I suppose, find out quite a bit more about it. I was also very interested in science at school,、uh, having. Been at school in Scotland, we have a much、uh, broader education for much longer. So I did、um, maths and physics and chemistry right up to sort of higher level as well. So I've always had that interest in the scientific inquiry, I suppose.、Uh, so it doesn't make you queasy? Do you don't mind、uh, the kind of the maggots and the and the you know the, the blood and gore of it? I don't like the blood and gore at all,、um, and、I'm, I've got I've got much more relaxed about the maggots since I found out much more about the entomology. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't like blood. I have to say that's always been,、uh, you know, I didn't do biology. No, <laughs>、um, I mean it's easy to think of forensics being quite a modern field of expertise.、Um, but having read some of your book, this isn't actually the case, is it? No, I mean some of it goes back a long, long way. Really, as long as we've had scientific exploration, scientists have been interested in, in giving that a practical outlet, and and the courtroom has been one of many practical outlets that they've they've given that. So there's there's, there's cases going back right back to the, the late Middle Ages to the Renaissance,、um, where scientists are making discoveries and and、e- applying them to solving crime. And a lot of those early discoveries, of course, were, were to do with things like poisons. Um, and also, as we discovered more about the human body, like the circulation of blood, these were all issues that were brought to bear on、uh, the issues of crime. And when did people actually first start becoming aware that insects could help solve crimes? The notion of、uh, insects being able to help solve crime, I think, was something that. As scientists began to understand the life cycle of insects, they they understood that the presence of insects on a body, for example, could be used to sort of count backwards, as it were, to when that body was definitely dead.、Uh, originally, scientists believed that maggots were a, a spontaneous eruption in the corpse, and it took them a while to understand that they were in fact the larvae of of flies. And once they started understanding these principles, they were able to apply them in a very practical way. And in fact. The whole science of forensic entomology has now become quite precise,、um, as people understand very clearly the impact of, of temperature fluctuations、uh, and those sort of things on the pupation of, of larvae and the creation, the, the development of, of flies from these maggots, and also the the rate at which maggots can consume a dead body, which can be quite remarkable. 
a very you start off with a few flies, three flies effectively can get rid of the whole body of a horse. Yeah, oh, that was fast. I mean, I read that in your in the the, the bits that you sent over, and it was fascinating. And um, it was amazing that you know they can you can always pinpoint when something died within a few days just by the the, the insects and the the flies and you know that type of thing on on the actual body. Yeah, I mean, we look at flies uh, in our kitchen in the summer and we don't think of them as being indicators of how long time, how, how much time has elapsed uh, since a body died. But in fact, those, those flies can be very precisely calibrated. And not just uh, one set of flies, also the, the flies have a, a very specific order in which they visit a corpse. So you have one wave of flies, the blow flies, then you have other flies whose whose mouths, if you like, are geared up to a different sort of eating. It's all really quite disgusting when you think about it, but it is also very scientifically precise. So an entomologist can look at the population on a dead body and tell very precisely what stage it's at and how long it's been there and what's been going on. I think one of the most fascinating cases uh, that I came across in this field was um, the pupil cases, the, the, the cases from the, the maggots, if you like, of, of a particular fly were found in a, in a house. And when they were analysed for DNA, they found the presence of cocaine. Uh, and then they, they analysed further, and they were able to say that these particular maggots had fed on a particular individual, because the maggots have sort of... Um, have, have quite rough mouths and they tear at the flesh of what they're eating and some of the DNA had remained trapped in them as they became pupae. And so by, by just looking at the cases of these pupae, the police were able to say there was a murder here and this is the victim. And what do you think has been the most important breakthrough in, in forensic science? I don't know, I think most people would probably say DNA. Uh, and that that is a huge breakthrough because that enabled identification to be made on a on a on a vast scale that was was impossible beforehand. But I think um, elements that are also quite important are the whole areas around which we can identify human bodies, and a lot of that is to do with uh, I suppose the, the, the skeletal remains. So you can take the skeletal remains of a body, and and, and now you can tell where the mother was when that person was being carried in the womb. You can tell where they were living when they were six years old, where they've been for the last seven years or so. And all these elements of actually being able to identify remains, I think, have also become hugely important beyond the narrowness of the DNA. The analysis of skeletal remains um, as part of legal judgments took place quite a long time ago. It's not a recent thing, is it? Yeah. I mean, the, the, there's, there are two elements also looking at skeletal remains you can look at, you know, the, the sort of analysis using big machines like mass spectrometers. But, of course, also there are just the physical uh, things that a skeletal remains tell you about a body. And, you know, there have been cases as far back as the, I think the 12th century in China where a coroner reached a judgment on, on a identification of a body because of the per peculiarities of the rib cage. Someone was described as being pigeon-chested, and, and when they, they found the, the remains, this was indeed someone who had been pigeon chested so they were able to establish that this was indeed the missing person yeah and what sort of, how did you go about researching this did you actually have to do sort of um physical research did you did you sort of shadow a forensic scientist how did you go about it um well i went and talked to forensic scientists um every, every chapter for, focuses on a specific discipline within forensic science and i went and, and spoke to people who, who do this as their everyday bread and butter. It's, it's the thing they do, it's the thing they're passionate about. And um, I had them take me through what it is they do and how they do it. I went and looked back at the, the historical roots of those particular scientific disciplines and, and put together a narrative based on that, drawing in, obviously, original cases. Um, so trying to give a flavour of how the disciplines got started and, and how they had developed and where they're at at the moment. I think uh, when, you, when you talk to the people who actually perform these scientific uh, experiments and, and, and make these discoveries and make these steps forward and, and, and apply them to the, the criminal cases that they, they get involved in, you understand that uh, they understand there's a history behind this and they're also driven by the desire to, to carry it forward. They all know this is not the end of the road for their particular discipline. They all want to drive it forward. Mm. And when you were writing and, and researching the book and talking to these people, did you gain a sense of how perceptions towards those who've, who've used forensic science um, th you know, through history um, ha have changed over time? Um, I don't know. The scientists have changed very much. I think they've all been driven by, by a passion, 
Um, and I think it is um, both that passion for uh, getting to the scientific truth, but also for making the science work. I, I think what's interesting about forensic scientists is that they're not just interested in abstract theory. They're not just interested in knowledge for the sake of knowledge. They're interested in knowledge that allows us to do things better, that allows us to achieve results better. Um, and and I, I, you know, I, I wholeheartedly support that. Mm. And, and can modern forensics um, be used to solve you know, crimes that are centuries old? Um, I don't know about crimes that are centuries old, but they're certainly being used to solve crimes that are of more recent history. If you like, the sort of whole idea of cold cases where crimes are now being resolved because somebody's grandson or somebody's nephew commits a crime now and through fa familial DNA analysis uh, they're popping up with results from, from murders and rapes that go back 20, 30, 40 years. Um, so there's definitely uh, a sense in which those crimes of the past are being resolved. I think for older crimes uh, it becomes much more problematic um, but certainly there are, there are ways now of, of examining ancient remains like the Richard III body in the Leicester car park, you know, through DNA analysis and through examination of the skeletal remains, we're able to say definitively this is Richard III. So I don't know if you count that as a crime from the past, but it's certainly an interesting historical case from the past. Yeah, so there's a lot more to be done with forensics then. So there's, there's always room um, for examining cases and, and, and looking again at, at the received wisdom. Uh, it's quite interesting, I suppose, with, with the case of, of murders as well, because we've we've tended to um, hang on to, if you like, the sort of the the, the, the remnants of murders, if you like, the, the the exhibits in places like Scotland Yard's Black Museum. They've kept things from from murder cases from long ago. So it may well be that if forensic scientists ever get a spare minute, these are some of the cases they can investigate. Um, are there any early landmark cases that stood out for you while you were researching the book? I think one of the cases that certainly fascinated me even before I came to write this book is the Buck Ruxton case in the 1930s. And that case really is a standout for me because it was one of the earliest examples of several forensic disciplines being applied to one case to come to a resolution of what at the time seemed a, a, a completely mysterious puzzle. Um, these human remains were found by the side of a, a stream in, in Scotland uh, and to application of... Um, various forms of forensic. For example, they took an x-ray of the skull and superimposed it on the photograph of the missing wife of, of this doctor, Buck Ruxton, and established that this indeed was the skull that corresponded to the photograph of her face. And there were various other uh, forensic tests carried out on the, on the human remains, and it was a case where all these things came together and convicted somebody who really thought he'd got away with murder. And there were practical detective things like the remains being wrapped in a newspaper that had been produced in a particular area on a particular date. And so all these little elements came together to, to make a case. And of course there were also forensic entomology involved in this case as well. The, the maggots that were involved in the Buck Ruxton case persist to this day. They've been preserved and they are in the... Uh, Science Museum, and you can you can see the very maggots that fed on on Mrs. Ruxton's flesh, which oh, is wow. a gory <laughs> idea, but mm. they're there. <laughs> and all of those things uh, were, were say, early applications of these different forensic disciplines that came together in in a landmark murder case. That was Val McDermott. Val's latest book, Forensics: The Anatomy of Crime is on sale now, published by Profile Books in the UK and the US. Just before we go, here's a quick reminder that our December issue is still on sale for a few more days. In this month's magazine, we uncover the lost voices of Celtic Britain. We explore the changing nature of First World War remembrance. We consider what life was like in Britain at the time of Waterloo. And we find out why the 1864 presidential election may have been Abraham Lincoln's greatest test. You can get hold of the magazine in all good news agents and digitally. And now is also a great time to take out a subscription. If you're in the UK, you'll get to choose a fantastic free history book when you subscribe, including new accounts of The Wars of the Roses, Waterloo and Thomas Cromwell. To take advantage of this deal, please visit historyextra.com forward slash subscribe. And it will be available for a limited time only. And if you enjoy history podcasts, don't forget to download our new History of Britain special episode, 
which is available for free from our website. You'll find it at historyextra.com forward slash Britain podcast. You will need to be logged in to access it, but don't worry if you've not already registered for the site. It's free and very simple to do. And that's pretty much it for this week. Do join us next time when we'll be talking about the North Sea with Michael Pye and Francis Pryor will be taking a trip to visit some amazing Bronze Age remains. Thanks for listening to this History Extra podcast, which was produced by Jack Fletcher. Do let us know what you think about this episode by emailing podcast at historyextra.com and we might read out your messages in future episodes. Alternatively, why not keep in touch via Twitter or Facebook, where you'll find us at History Extra. For more great history content, don't forget to visit our website, historyextra.com, where you will find history quizzes, galleries, articles, and more. Plus, it's where you can download every single previous episode of this podcast. 